Welcome to Fatigue Analysis. I'm Dr. Stewart, and today we're going to continue our lecture on multi-axial loading. Today we're going to cover experimentation. We're going to look at uh, critical uh, plane approaches, and we're going to learn how to uh, apply uh, multi-axial loading conditions with the fatigue crack growth approach. Let's start with experimentation. Multi-axial fatigue testing is fairly similar to traditional fatigue testing. The main difference is that we are now applying loads in more than one direction. A classic example would be uh, a load frame that applies both an axial load up and down while also applying some uh, torsional load by the, uh, the turning of a lower or upper grip. We can see here an example uh, from, from MTS, I mean, I mean from Instron, of a uh, biaxial load frame that does just that, where the, the crosshead moves up and down, and it also, uh, with this motor at the top, the, the upper grip rotates so that we can get biaxial loading tension torsion. We can see here an example of a specimen that's been subjected to, to that loading mode, where we see kind of like a Twizzler shape in its structure. Another way for us to apply biaxial loading is by pressurizing a specimen. Now, this is very typical for uh, trying to understand the fatigue loading in tubes and hollow tubes and, and pipes. Um, in these examples, uh, the, the specimen is... Uh, uh, does, uh, is placed into specialized fixtures where the grips are allowed to apply an axial load in tension or compression while also having a port to allow a pressurizing gas to fill the hollow specimen. And this type of test is fairly typical in testing of uh, uh, piping, particularly in nuclear power plants. Another way that we can apply loading is with biaxial or even triaxial uh, cruciform testing, where multiple actuators are lined up in order for us to, to, to very dynamically control loading in, in, in different directions. Now, once we've uh, conducted these experiments, we then want to plot uh, the results of those experiments, whether it's a stress life or, or here, this example, of this uh, strain life approach. So we can actually see and compare a uniaxial loading condition uh, versus say something like pure torsion or even mixed uh, uh, types of uh, multi-axial loading. When we do also look at the, at the specimen themselves, we will see that we get a mixture of failure surfaces between the different loading conditions, where if we were just doing uh, rotational bending, we would get, and, and under high nominal or low nominal stresses, we would get a, a certain set uh, uh, um, failure surface. While if we were applying torsional loading, we would get a very different uh, uh, observation of the failure surface. So when we're doing multi-axial loading, where we're combining bending and torsion, we will see a combination of these types of failure surfaces depending on how proportional those loads are. Now, uh, in terms of test standards for multi-axial loading, uh, ASTM has produced some test standards for axial and torsional biaxial loading, originally developed in 2002. It's continuing to be evolved every year. In addition, numerous special technical publications by ASTM and ASM and other organizations have come out to deal with multi-axial fatigue loading because it is very complicated and it's a very expensive and easy to mess up experiment. Now let's go into non-proportional loading. Non-proportional loading, as we learned in the, in the previous uh, uh, video, it, uh, is the relationship between principal stresses within a uh, fatigue test. So the example would be sigma two over sigma one and uh, sigma three over sigma two. Those are proportions. Proportional loading is when those uh, ratios remain fixed with time. 
meaning sigma 2 and sigma 1, the distance between them remains the same. Non-proportional loading is where that's not true, where sigma 1 and sigma 2 are out of phase, and so they change with time, right? So here is a schematic that, that uh, came from the book that kind of illustrates this process. In, in sketch A, we have a stress element that's subject to tension and torsion. Uh, uh, in B, we see that we have applied uh, in phase axial and shear histories, where the peaks are at the same point. And we can see in the case of in phase that in in phase loading, we get a, a, a nice straight linear relationship or a fixed slope between the uh, the axial stresses and the torsional shear stresses, right? But in the case when we're out of phase, when we load in out of phase, we do not have that constant slope that exists between the loading directions. Instead, we produce kind of an ellipsoid shape that's dependent on the amount, of that, um, amount that we are out of phase, which is, in this case, 90 degrees. When we apply the 90 degree out of phase axial and shear stress histories, we kind of see these uh, um, uh, stre uh, normal stress, shear stress, these more circle type plots. Um, and, and from this non-proportional loading, we're going to produce a different uh, kind of rate of cycles to failure. Now, here's an example of us conducting many, many experiments at different degrees of out of phase and we can see kind of that, that depending on the amount of out of phase that we are, we exist in between the pure axial case and the pure torsion case. So in essence, we kind of have like a mixed uh, uh, failure or, or cycles to failure that, that kind of sits in between the pure axial and the pure torsional case. Now, how do we kind of, how do we manage this relationship between the normal and the shear stresses. Well, well, uh, uh, one approach is to introduce the critical plane approach. Uh, in a critical plane approach, fatigue cracks initiate on planes of maximum shear. And at these orientations, normal stresses also influence the fatigue crack initiation. Early studies focus on the determining the effect of static axial stressor strain and cyclic shear stressor strain where friction between shearing surface is reduced with the addition of the axial load, so it results in a, a shorter fatigue life. Generally, there are two types of critical plane approaches, those that are stress-based and those that are strain-based. However, the, the most successful approach is kind of a mixed approach that includes strain energy. So one of the early approach is by Kandel, he pre prepared in 1982. In this approach, there is a kind of a, a linear relationship between the shear uh, stress amplitude and the normal stress range, where the addition of those two is equal to C, a constant value, constant parameter. And that is that C is a material property. This, in essence, is, is telling us that the combination of, of these loading conditions is going to tell us what orientation our crack will grow. Other approaches that have been developed, some, some kind of older school approaches, is one by Findlay in 1959. Here we see we have two material properties, a lowercase k and c, and signs model in 1959, which is a bit more of a complex approach, where we're almost introducing a, a, a type of a von Mises stress equation or exactly a von Mises stress equation inside of the signs approach. More recent efforts uh, include those by Brown and Miller in 1973. Uh, again, it's, it's almost a mirror of the other approaches we saw, but the most successful and the one that is continuing to be used to this day is the Fatimi Sosi parameter developed in 1988. Uh, uh, we should remember or we should recognize Fatimi and Sosi because these are actually the authors of the textbooks we're using in this class. In the Fatimi Sosi parameter, we kind of have a mixed approach here where we have uh, a term 
that is based in strain. So this uh, this uh, 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 shear strain amplitude times ones. And then we have a term that is based in strain energy, where we have strain times stress, which is going to give us an energy parameter to a certain extent. Oh, but actually, since we're normalizing stress, this is this is actually a pure strain approach. This is actually a pure strain approach. Now we'll notice inside of the Fatimi Sosi parameter that we have three material constants. We have K and C, kind of typical of the critical plane approach, but we include the monotonic yield strength of the material to normalize the max stress. Now this parameter, we can actually couple it with uh, the, uh, the um, uh, I believe this is a Ramberg-Osgood equation that describes uh, how the, the uh, cycles to failure evolve in our structure. So, so actually using this combined equation, we could use it to not only plot our hysteresis loops, but also from that, predict our cycles to failure. Now, when we apply the fatimi Sosi parameter to experimental data, we actually produce a nice trend. What, 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 what results when we apply it to data is that the data kind of coalesces on a line, it coalesces on a single line. That means that the parameter as formed works well across many different types of multi-axial loading. And this is key. This is um, important because then that means this parameter can be used for many cases of multi-axial loading, right? So uh, examples of multi-axial fatigue. Uh, let's kind of remember that multi-axial fatigue is a combination of loads being applied to a structure that are either in phase or out of phase and in multiple directions, but also they can arise from stress concentrations, thermal stresses, even pre-existing residual stresses that lead to a non-equal uh, stress state within a structure. Loads are simultaneously applied in several directions, producing stresses with no bias to a particular direction. Now, can we apply or extend fatigue analysis techniques derived from uniaxial situations to multiaxial cases? Yes, we can. We've learned how to do it for stress life, for strain life, uh, but we have limited ac accuracy. More advanced methods do exist to improve the accuracy uh, under multiaxial loading. Uh, for example, using a thermodynamics framework where we apply strain energy or even uh, entropy uh, generation and etc., we can actually uh, more accurately predict uh, multi-axial fatigue loading, but at computational expense and some, some great difficulty. Now let's move on to crack growth behavior. Crack growth behavior is complicated when under multi-axial loading. The nucleation and early propagation of cracks are heavily influenced by the material processing, prior loading, and so on. And multi-axial loading also has an effect to play in the propagation of cracks. When we're in that nucleation phase and we're below the KTH, the threshold stress intensity factor, our crack propagation is very, very uncertain. It is very much driven by the microstructure, driven by processing, and by the loading state. Crack growth models have been extended to work for linear elastic fracture mechanics, where we use Paris's law. Uh, in these cases, we take Paris's law for, for the crack growth rate, and we introduce a delta K effect of a, an effective stress intensity factor range. That may, may include things such as biaxiality ratios and modified material constants to account for multiaxial loading. Now, this example here kind of shows what happens when we produce a good uh, delta K effective uh, uh, equation, when we figure out a good delta K effective. We can literally plot uh, uh, the failure of a real component and then uh, uh, plot over the top simulated predictions of what path the crack will take through the body. And this, these predictions are produced using Paris's law within a finite element uh, framework. 
Now, how do we get these effective stress intensity factors? Well, these factors are empirical in nature, where we conduct many experiments and then we uh, uh, do curve fitting or we apply logic in order to derive equations that describe the relationships under that loading state. Um, some examples here are the K effective, where we include K1, K2, and K3, the three uh, loading modes. Uh, um, here is another example where we include the Poisson's ratio, and then here's an even maybe a lower resolution example with just K1 and K2. Now these uh, um, K effectives, these are ones from the literature, but people do produce their own. People may, some people even use machine learning to develop these types of equations based on their data. Um, so the models uh, are fit to, to fatigue crack growth data, and, and most models assume that crack growth is accompanied by some minimally sized uh, crack tip plasticity. So the summary for fatigue crack growth, fatigue cracks can nucleate on, under either pure shear or axial loading. Multi-axial loading has little effect on mode one, but it makes a big effect in mode two and, and mode three, and, they, and the calculations are difficult. As the crack grows, the stress intensity field may change because the crack can turn. It can change its trajectory and direction, which will change the stress intensity field. So multi-axial fatigue summary. Uh, no general concession, consensus has been made on which is the best theory to predict multi-axial fatigue failure. Multi-axial fatigue is, is still kind of on the cutting edge, even though there have been decades of work within multi-axial loading. Live prediction models uh, assume continuous cycling with no hold period and under isothermal conditions. And multi-axial behavior of thermal mechanically cycled materials is an emerging topic of research. Basically, we're, where we, we're applying both thermal and mechanical loads, either in phase or out of phase. More advanced methods do exist to improve accuracy that are based on thermodynamics, such as strain energy, entropy generation, and etc. So design against multi-axial loading. Let's not ignore, so don't ignore, the presence of multi-axial states of stress, as that multi-axial loading can has a, have a significant effect on fatigue behavior. It's important to determine whether the alternating stresses or strains are proportional or non-proportional. Non-proportional cycling, cycling can produce additional cyclic hardening, hardening and often result in shorter fatigue life. It's important to recognize that equivalent stress and strain approaches are limited to simple proportional or non-proportional conditions, and that other more advanced methods, such as the critical plane method, are suitable for more complex non-proportional loading conditions. For this chapter, we have two homework assignments, uh, 10.5 and 10.9, coming from our textbook. Again, I'm Dr. Stewart, and thank you for joining me today in this video. Uh, and the references for this uh, lecture is the textbook, Metal Fatigue in Engineering, the second edition. This is the textbook for the class. And Shigley's Mechanical Engineering Design, 10th edition. This is an extra textbook that's got some good fatigue equations in it. All right. So that is our last lecture for multi-axial fatigue. Uh, look for a couple of example videos that will be heading to your way shortly. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and click the bell if you want the newest videos.